Welcome. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Start the Week with Wisdom. I'm your host, Bridget Burns from the University Innovation Alliance. And I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed. Doug and I team up each week, and we are on a roll these days uh, to have a conversation with leaders in the field, presidents and chancellors, folks who have a perspective uh, that we really want to elevate that gives you a sense of optimism and hope for the path ahead, but also reflects on their wisdom that they've gleaned from their time leading in higher ed. So that's why we call it Start the Week with Wisdom. Uh, and today we're joined by Devorah Lieberman, who uh, was the first female president of the University of Laverne in California. She has uh, announced her retirement. Uh, she's been, she will, when she leaves, she will have about doubled the normal uh, length of uh, tenure in, among college presidents. And we've had a lot of new presidents on recently, so it's nice to have uh, somebody with some experience who can help us uh, put, put the presidency in context. So welcome. Thank you. I'm glad you didn't say old president, but mm, maybe I, veteran. Never, I would never do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I, as I was commenting earlier, I appreciate the chance to talk to someone who has the long view of the presidency and that you, you served for a while long before COVID. We've had a lot of folks who their first exposure and their only exposure has been serving do, during and through COVID which has fundamentally changed the presidency in many ways. So um, we're really excited to hear from you. And I just wanted to start by asking you, you know, you because you have announced and you have served and, and served so well at your institution, curious about, you probably have a large number of things you could choose from, but I want to know what you would like to be remembered for and what your presidency you'd like it to be remembered for. Uh, well, first, Bridget and Doug, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of your weekly wisdom. I'm honored and I look forward to sharing some wisdom with the audience that is so dedicated to Inside Higher Ed and well beyond. So your question has to do with how do I want to be remembered? What do I want? What am I most proud of um, having served 12 years? And I think the uh, when I think about that, I, the answer is pretty simple. I would like to be remembered as a president who, uh, this is going to sound simplistic, uh, so I'll, I'll um, expand on it a little bit, but I'd like to be remembered for a president who led with her head, with her heart, with her vision, and took the time through these last 12 years to be present for every student, every faculty member, and every staff member. And that I advanced the mission of the university and focused on student success, affordability, accessibility, and student mobility into their professions. What, uh, and just a little quick follow-up on that. Um, I think most people say that they wanna be remembered. So here's what I don't, feel like is the the thing to be remembered for. I don't need to be remembered for raising the endowment from 36 million to 150 million. That was part of my job. I don't need to be remembered for being the architect, uh, the initial architect of the Laverne experience. That was a vision that came, that I brought in. I don't need to be remembered for all the buildings and the transformation on campus or starting the um, College of Health and Community Well-Being at the university. Those will all be part of our future. What I want most to be remembered for was nurturing, caring for, and uplifting students, faculty, and staff. It sounds like you have defined, well, I get that in terms of, if I think back on my legacy as well, and Doug, you might think about it, I'm like, I, yes, I want the, what I hear from that is uh, trust, that people feel like they can trust they trusted you as a leader that you were that you you that you were direct and you were honest with people and i'm just curious if compared to when you first became president i'm sure you you probably i don't know i, I guess do presidents think about their legacy as they come in do they do they figure out what they want to be known for before but i'm just wondering if um were there any lessons that happened early on in the presidency that helped you identify that this is the thing that you want to be known for this is how you want to lead that is a great question, Bridget. Um, when I think back on my professional career, 
And I, uh, let me come back to how leading coming in. So when I interviewed at the University of Laverne, and I really didn't know, I mean, I studied it, but before I was contacted by the search firm, I didn't know much about the university I, other than it was in Southern California. And when I read the values of this university, and it was founded in 1891 by a, re, a Christian denomination called the Church of the Brethren, and every president from 1891 to 2011, when I started, was male. And every president was from this church, the Church of the Brethren, even though the university was no longer affiliated uh, with the Church of the Brethren. And I said, ooh, I'd be the first female. And uh, <laughs> with the last name like Lieberman, it's obvious that I wasn't coming from the Church of the Brethren. I said, uh, what would I bring? What do I bring to this university? And when I read the values of the university, that it was committed from 1891 until today to uh, lifelong learning, to community, to ethical decision making, to community uh, and civic being civically engaged. When I read those values and I saw the students that we served, I said, this, I've been preparing my entire professional life to be part of this university. And if I were fortunate enough to be the president of this university, what could I bring? So to answer your question about uh, legacy and what I came in with, I came in with uh, this background of serving students who didn't know if a university was affordable to them or accessible to them. And I came in saying this institution is dedicated to these kinds of students being a Hispanic serving institution and my background, my experience, my passion for this vision, I said, not coming in saying, what's my legacy going to be other than moving this university forward in ways that support the students and that this university will exist for the next 132 years. That's great. I appreciate that in terms of thinking about not needing to be the cookie cutter idea of what the president prior was, but to focus right. instead on the North Star of the values of the institution and try and figure out how you're going to live those values and whether or not they align for you. That's that's great. Uh, and if there's any wisdom around that, it would be that a board of trustees hires and fires the president. That's one of their primary roles. And for a board of trustees to say, we're going to break the mold and say, hire a female who's not from the Church of the Brethren. That is a very bold mood move for a board and for a university and the university to embrace me like they have. My wisdom would be, be bold and say, what's the future of our institution? And it doesn't have to be, as you said, Bridget, a cookie cutter mold of who we have to have. Great. I'm, cur I'm curious. I mean, a lot of institutions, uh, particularly those like yours that are uh, tuition driven, uh, uh, are, are really having to, if not remake themselves, they're definitely having to probably be something different now than they were certainly 120 years ago or whenever the institution was founded. And, and, but, but where, what is, what do you see institutions like yours becoming? What have, how do you feel like your presidency has positioned a place like Laverne um, to, to be, what, what has it, have you positioned, helped position it to be for the next generation of students and how does it, how is it different um, from what it has been? Uh, well, Doug, that question is, as people say, the $64,000 question, but with inflation, it's probably the $164,000 yeah. question. Right. Um, so when I came in, one of the things I asked the whole campus is uh, how, how are we, because we're surrounded, we're in a $6 million, a 6 million person catchment area. So it's an in, so inland Southern California is enormous but there are uh, 
many community colleges, many CSUs, several UCs, and many private institutions, private not-for-profit like the University of Laverne. So when I came in, I said, okay, if we're going to survive, and we know we are, we must identify how are we distinctive from everybody else, how are we relevant from everybody else, and how can we be competitive? Because if we're not distinctive and we're not relevant, we cannot be competitive with all these other institutions and with the increasing distrust from the community of higher education in general, how are we going to be trusted, relevant, distinctive, and surviving? So at the very beginning, um, in 2012, when we started to do our 2020 strategic vision, we went to the community. Well, we actually, before we went to the community, we hired a consultant and we said, what are going to be the most needed jobs, the most desirable jobs in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And rather than the university telling the community what they need, we said, and we were very strategic, what are the needs in this community and what are the professions that will be the most in demand? So they came back and they said, uh, health professions first, a lot of media because of our um, proximity to downtown LA and Hollywood and supply chain management. So they had this whole list of what's going to be most needed. And this was 2012. Then we went back and said, okay, for the students, the 6,500 students at the University of Laverne, the kinds of students we attract, which of those professions will be the most attractive to the students that come to the university? And they said, the health professions, and the number one profession was physician assistant and then nursing. So based on that, we did this 2020 strategic vision and we created the first allied health program at the university, which was the physician assistant. That's up and running today. That we have about 30 seats because of accreditation for incoming students, 1400 applications a year for those 30 seats. So my point is when I came in, rather than saying, here's what we're doing for the community, we said, what does the community need? And as a result of all of that, we have now opened a fifth college, which is the College of Health and Community Wellbeing, which has physician assistant, nursing, psychology, all these health related professions that are now serving the community. So when you say what's going to, uh, when I came in or for other presidents, what, what can you do when you come in or in, in your on the presidential track to lift your institution, be listening to what the community needs, partnering with the community, creating the programs and grounding it in general education, liberal arts, those solid, that solid grounding, but adding to it the professions that are most needed in your surrounding communities. I love the, that's just a great model of listening and I, that you didn't just go with what the community said or what business leaders said that you then went back to the students. Like, you know, this is one of the things that people have to understand is that empathy is the first step of design. If you really want to design for the future, you have to understand and identify the constituents and truly spend time listening and not just, you know, fortune tell, like assuming <laughs> that you know what people want and that can lead to great design that can lead to the kind of strategy that is exactly what um, private colleges need to have um, if they're going to be competitive. So I think that's, um, that's a great model. Um, so I want to shift back to you in terms of, uh, I want to know what's been the most surprising thing about your career. Hmm. The most surprising thing about my career. Uh, well, um, I don't know how different this is than others, but I, from a very young age, I grew up knowing that I wanted to have an, a positive impact on others. And I knew that from uh, my family history, 
from a very young age, healing the world, repairing the world, making a difference. So um, I chose a career in intercultural communication, which is my doctorate, because I wanted to um, work with students and to be a professor so that they could learn the skills to cross lines of difference. So what's surprising, I thought I was always going to be a professor. And very early in my professorship, the provost and president tapped me and said, you need to go into administration. So I said, oh, I can make a greater difference, I suppose, in helping others, uh, assisting others, supporting others to cross lines of difference from an administrative perspective. That was at Portland State University. And when I was at Portland State, a president from the East Coast at Wagner College tapped me and said, you know, I think you could make a big difference if you were the provost at my institution. And I said, wow, that's interesting. I thought I was always going to be at Portland State. So I was tapped to be a provost. And then when I was a provost for eight years, uh, I got this call from uh, the search firm that said, uh, we think it's time for you to look at a presidency. So what was most surprising that others maybe saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. And I was always tapped. And then I said, from that original question, how can I make the greatest difference? And when the University of Laverne contacted me, uh, I said, well, let me look at the university. That's where I felt I could make the greatest difference at this period in my career. So the biggest surprise, the biggest surprise is I was never looking. I was always looked at and, um, sort of tapped on the shoulder. So I don't know if that's a surprise, but it were things that were unexpected. I'll put it that way. That's great. And I think the other, as I'm thinking through your question, um, one of the biggest surprises for me as a president, uh, I said at the beginning that um, when I came in, our endowment was 36 million, and then we raised it to 151 million. Um, I think it's a little, the market hasn't been good to us recently, so it's, <laughs> it's gone down a couple notches. But at 151 million, it was a big surprise to me that as a fundraiser and a friend raiser, telling the stories of the students, talking about the passion of the university, uh, it became a joy to raise money for scholarships, for buildings, for programs, for endowed professorships. It was not work. It was a, a work of passion, a labor of love. So it surprised me that telling these stories tapped people's hearts and their passions and their wallets so that they gave their time, their treasure, and their talents to the university. So it surprised me that uh, telling these incredible stories would have such an impact on others and resulted in uh, raising the endowment a great deal. When, when you were describing, uh, answering the first question Bridget asked about sort of the, your approach to the presidency, uh, what you described focusing on kind of the personal um, uh, connection with students and faculty. It's a very personal uh, approach. And, and I'm curious that uh, the presidency can be a very, um, I don't know, it can be a very taxing role. And it's obviously a, has a huge personal element as well as sort of the professional one. And I'm curious how you balance um, the personal and professional aspects of the presidency. And how do you make sure uh, you're you're able to be as present as you uh, want to be, uh, given the, the intense expectations and demands on, on the professional demands? Um, well, for me, Doug, I think that's a pretty simple answer. And that is, you know, people talk about work-life balance as though work is work and life is outside of work. And that's where you get your balance. And that doesn't that that model doesn't fit me because when I'm at work, which is pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, my balance 
you have the pol internal politics, you've got budget, you've got recruitment, uh, you've got all of these pressures that, uh, that are difficult. I mean, to put it bluntly, very difficult, constantly navigating. Where do I get my balance? Where do I get my energy? Saturday, I went to a, a, the women's basketball game. That gave me energy. I went to a play, a student play. That gave me energy. I walk around campus between meetings and I, I have and I talk to the students. I have lunch with the faculty. Once a year, I put on a football uniform and I go out and I scrimmage. It, it's it's a gentle scrimmage with the football team. <laughs> For 11 years, I've been doing that. That gives me joy. I just said to the basketball team, I'm going to give give me a uniform. I'll come out and practice with you. That's what gives me joy. Uh, the whole package, I know that's my job, but what refreshes me, rejuvenates me, it's be, listening to the faculty having lunch, listening to them talk about their scholarship, being with the students who never thought they were going to go to college, the joy. On Friday, I went to one student had a photography exhibit. He never knew that he would ever be dealing with photography and his pictures were gorgeous. That's what gives me joy. It rejuvenates me. And if you didn't have that person, if I didn't have that personal aspect of the job, I could not do what I need to do. That's great. I, I want to, um, one other element that we had talked about briefly before the show is um, that you, these jobs are very difficult to do alone. And in fact, they don't happen alone, that they are, um, you know, I've seen this with my own institutions, especially as of late, that there is, uh, there's enough work for two people with this job. And in many cases, there's an expectation that if you are in a partnership or have a spouse, that they will do a lot of this kind of unpaid labor for the institution. And that is, um, that's, that's something that should be taken seriously because there isn't, it's like two people earn the salary, but one person brings home the check, right? Um, and I'm just curious if, if as you are, you know, rounding third base and thinking back on your presidency, is there advice that you could give to others who are contemplating uh, one of these roles as they, how do they set themselves up to even come in with their eyes open about that particular challenge in terms of supporting um supporting your partner or spouse so that they're supporting you so much? Right. I think that is a great question. Coupled with that is how does the spouse support the president behind the scenes, in front of the scenes and behind the scenes? I, I My husband's not listening to this, but he's my hero. And uh, I couldn't do this job if I didn't have such a supportive spouse. And I mean that from completely. Uh, he's so behind the scenes, he's my kitchen cabinet, literally in the kitchen, the kitchen cabinet where I can talk about things that I can't talk about with anybody else, personnel issues, things that I'm worried about. Because as the president, you're constantly inspiring the entire campus to move forward together. And I can say to my husband, here's what I'm really worried about. Give me your advice. Just be a sounding board. So behind the scenes, it's critical, I think, that the spouse has a partner that supports you in everything that you're facing. That's the first thing. The second thing is my husband has his own profession and he's doing, you know, he's got a full time job along with being the presidential partner. So I have to be respectful of his time and his job. As we came into this presidency together, he would come to every athletic event with me, every play with me. We probably have dinners inside the house or outside, um, donor dinners, I call it, uh, probably four or five nights a week, galas. So at the beginning, and it's every week, 365 days a year that you're out and maybe home one night a week, maybe two nights a week. And many of those nights are in the house with dinners with donors. So at the beginning, my husband came to every single thing along with his own job. 
And as we've moved through these 12 years, we have, uh, we have a system. Here are things you must attend. Here are things you don't even show up. You don't need to be there. And here are things in the middle you choose if you want to attend or not. That has become our go-to model. And he chooses. If it's a must attend, he's there. He'll adjust his schedule. If it's a if you choose, he will choose what he wants to attend or not. And it's been uh, very, very successful. The other thing, if you are listening and you are a female president, uh, at the beginning of our presidency, we would be at many events. And I can't tell you the number of times people came up to my husband and me and said to my husband, oh, I've been dying to meet the new president. And my husband would say, great, she's standing right next to me. So that was uh, something I didn't resent it. He didn't resent it. But we had to realize that was a reality of being a new president. Yes, I appreciate you sharing about that, because that's something people don't talk about. And um, and yet it is consistently, uh, it, I think it's one of the most necessary components of the presence. You got to have somebody you talk to because everyone else works for you or wants something from you. Very difficult to, to navigate these roles. Um, my last question is just a quick one, which is the best advice that you have received that has, has served you in your career. Uh, that's an easy one. Uh, about a month after I became the president, I was having lunch with Dr. Ispahani, a faculty member at the university who is 88 years old, and he's taught here for 55 years. And I said to him, wow, Dr. Ispahani, you've been here forever, several lifetimes, and you're still teaching here. What's the best advice you could give me? I said, we're facing all these problems. I feel like everybody's angry. Everybody wants something from me. This is I'm having a very tough time. What advice can you give me, Dr. Ispahani? And he said, well, I'd like you to think about a, mos a beautiful mosaic. And when you stand back and you look at a gorgeous mosaic, you see the beauty of the mosaic. But remember, Devorah, every mosaic has a few missing tiles. And if you only focus on those missing tiles, you will miss the beauty of the mosaic. The University of Laverne has some missing tiles. You're going to fix those. Never forget the beauty of this university and its mission, because that's why we're here. And the advice I give everybody who's listening is the beauty of the institution where you work. That's why you're there. Work on being part of the solution to fix those missing tiles, but don't focus only on the missing tiles, focus on the beauty of the institution. Well, that is a perfect ending for our show. Thank you so much, uh, President Lieberman. This has been really useful and we appreciate you sharing your wisdom and advice with our audience. Uh, Doug, thank you as always for being an excellent host and for those folks at home, we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Bridget and Doug. Thank you. Thank you.